The Evolution of Modesty, Part 3 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 1, by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by John Thomas Coos. The Evolution of Modesty, Part 3. It is impossible to contemplate this series of phenomena, so radically persistent, whatever its changes of form, and so constant throughout every day of civilization, without feeling that, although modesty cannot properly be called an instinct, there must be some psychological basis to support it. Undoubtedly, such a basis is formed by that vasomotor mechanism of which the most obvious outward sign is, in human beings, the blush. All the allied emotional forms of fear, shame, bashfulness, timidity, are to some extent upheld by this mechanism. But such is especially the case with the emotion we are now concerned with. The blush is the sanction of modesty. The blush is, indeed, only a part, almost perhaps an accidental part, of the organic turmoil with which it is associated. Partridge, who has studied the phenomena of blushing in 120 cases, Pedagogical Seminary, April 1897, finds that the following are the general symptoms. Tremors near the wrist, weakness in the limbs, pressure, trembling, warmth, weight, or beating in the chest, warm wave from feet upward, quivering of heart, stoppage, and then rapid beating of heart, coldness all over, followed by heat, dizziness, tingling of the toes and fingers, numbness, something rising in the throat, smarting of the eyes, singing in ears, prickling sensations of face, and pressure inside head. Partridge considers that the disturbance is primarily central, a change in the cerebral circulation, and that the actual redness of the surface comes late in the nerve storm and is really but a small part of it. There has been some discussion as to why, and indeed how far blushing is confined to the face. Henle, Uber das Erothen, thought that we blush in the face because all nervous phenomena produced by mental stages appear first in the face owing to the anatomical arrangement of the nerves of the body. Darwin, expression of the emotions, argued that attention to a part tends to produce capillary activity in the part, and the face has been the chief object of attention. It has also been argued on the other hand, that the blush is the vestigial remains of a general erythism of sex, in which shame originated, that the blush was thus once more widely diffused, and is so still among the women of some lower races, its limitation to the face being due to sexual selection, and the enhanced beauty thus achieved. Fair once had occasion to examine, when completely nude, a boy of thirteen whose sexual organs were deformed. When accused of masturbation, he became covered by a blush which spread uniformly over his face, neck, body, and limbs, before and behind, except only the hands and feet. Fair asks whether such a universal blush is more common than we imagine, or whether the state of nudity favors its manifestation. Comtes Rendus Societe de Biologie, April 1st, 1905. It may be added that Partridge mentions one case in which the hands blushed. The sexual relationships of blushing are unquestionable. It occurs chiefly in women. It aims its chief intensity at puberty and during adolescence. Its most common occasion is some more or less sexual suggestion. Among 162 occasions of blushing enumerated by Partridge, by far the most frequent cause was teasing, usually about the other sex. An erection it has been said, is a blushing of the penis. 
Stanley Hall seems to suggest that the sexual blush is a vicarious genital flushing of blood diverted from the genital sphere by an inhibition of fear, just as, in girls, giggling is also very frequently a vicarious outlet of shame. The sexual blush would thus be the outcome of ancestral sex fear. It is an irritation of sexual erethism that the blush may contain an element of pleasure. Bloch remarks that the blush is sexual because reddening of the face as well as of the genitals is an accomplishment of sexual emotion. Betrage de etologie de psychopathia sexualis, till second page 39. Do you not think, a correspondent writes, that the sexual blush at least really represents a vaso-relaxer effect quite the same as erection? The embarrassment which arises is due to a perception under circumstances which are felt to be unsuited for such a condition. There may arise the fear of awakening, disgust by the exhibition of a state which is out of place. I have noticed that such a blush is produced when a sufficiently young and susceptible woman is pumped full of compliments. This blush seems accompanied by pleasure, which does not always change to fear or disgust, but is felt to be attractive. When discomfort arises, most women say that they feel this because it looks as if they had no control over themselves. When they feel that there is no need for control, they no longer feel fear, and the relaxer effect has a wider field of operation, producing a general rosiness, erection of spinal, sexual organs, etc. Such a blush would thus be a partial sexual equivalent and allow of the inhibition of other sexual effects through the warning it gives, and the fear aroused, as well as being in itself a slight outlet of relaxer energy. When the relationships of the persons concerned allow freedom to the special sexual stimuli, as in marriage, blushing does not occur so often, and when it does, it has not so often the consequent of fear. There can be no doubt that the blush is sexually attractive. The blush is the expression of an impulse to concealment and flight, which tends automatically to arouse in the beholder the corresponding impulse of pursuit, so that the central situation of courtship is at once presented. Women are more or less conscious of this, as well as men, and this recognition is an added source of embarrassment when it cannot become a source of pleasure. The ancient use of rouge testifies to the beauty of the blush, and Darwin stated that, in Turkish slave markets, the girls who readily blushed fetched the highest prices. To evoke a blush, even by producing embarrassment, is very commonly a cause of masculine gratification. Savages, both men and women, blush even beneath a dusky skin. For the phenomenon of blushing among different races, see Weight Anthropologie de Nature Vocaire, BD 1, pages 149 to 150. And it is possible that natural selection, as well as sexual selection, has been favorable to the development of the blush. It is scarcely an accident that, as has been often observed, criminals or the antisocial element of the community, whether by the habits of their lives or by congenital abnormality, blush less easily than normal persons. Kroner, Das Koperlich Gefühl, 1887, page 130, remarks the origin of a specific connection between shame and blushing is the work of a social selection. It is certainly an immediate advantage for a man not to blush. Indirectly, however, it is a disadvantage, because in many ways he will be known as shameless, and on that account, as a rule, he will be shut out from propagation. This social selection will be specially exercised on the female sex, and on this account women blush to a greater extent and more readily than men. 
the importance of the blush and the emotional confusion behind it as the sanction of modesty is shown by the significant fact that by lulling emotional confusion it is possible to inhibit the sense of modesty in other words we are here in the presence of a fear to a large extent a sex fear impelling to concealment and dreading self-attention this fear naturally disappears even though its ostensible cause remains when it becomes apparent that there is no reason for fear that is the reason why nakedness in itself has nothing to do with modesty or immodesty it is the conditions under which the nakedness occurs which determine whether or not modesty will be aroused if none of the factors of modesty are violated if no embarrassing self-attention is excited if there is a consciousness of perfect propriety alike in the subject and in the spectator nakedness is entirely compatible with the most scrupulous to modesty a duval a pupil of ingress tells that a female model was once quietly posing, completely nude, at the École des Beaux Art. Suddenly, she screamed and ran to cover herself with her garments. She had seen a workman on the roof gazing inquisitively at her through a skylight. And Paolo Lombroso describes how a lady, a, diplomat a diplomatist's wife, who went to a gathering where she found herself the only woman in evening dress, felt to her own surprise such sudden shame that she could not keep back her tears. It thus comes about that the emotion of modesty necessarily depends on the feelings of the people around. The absence of the emotion by no means signifies immodesty provided that the reactions of modesty are at once in motion under the stress of a spectator's eye that is seen to be lustful inquisitive or reproachful that is proved to be the case among primitive peoples everywhere the japanese woman naked as in daily life she sometimes is remains unconcerned because she excites no disagreeable attention but the inquisitive and unmannerly european's eyes at once causes her to feel confusion strats a physician and one moreover who had long lived among the japanese who frequently go naked found that naked japanese women felt no embarrassment in his presence it is doubtless as a cloak to the blush that we must explain the curious influence of darkness in restraining the manifestations of modesty as many lovers have discovered and as we may notice in our cities after dark the influence of darkness in inhibiting modesty is a very ancient observation burton in the anatomy of melancholy quotes from dandinus the saying nox facit impudentus directly associating this with blushing and bargagli the sienese novelist wrote in the sixteenth century that it is commonly said of women that they will do in the dark what they would not do in the light <clears throat> it is true that the immodesty of a large city at night is to some extent explained by the eruption of prostitutes at that time Prostitutes, being habitually nearer to the threshold of immodesty, are more markedly affected by this influence. But it is an influence to which the most modest women are, at all events in some degree, susceptible. It has, indeed, been said that a woman is always more her real self in the dark than in the glare of daylight. That is part of what chamberlain calls her night inspiration traces of the night inspiration of the influence of the primitive fire group abound in woman indeed it may be said the life of southern europe and of american society of today illustrates this point abundantly that she is in a sense a night being for the activity physical and moral of modern women revealed example in the dance and the nocturnal intellectualities of society in this direction is remarkable 
perhaps we may style a good deal of her ordinary day labor as rest or the commonplaces and banalities of her existence uh, her evening and night life being the true side of her activities a f chamberlain work and rest popular science monthly march nineteen o two geisler who has studied the general influence of darkness on human psychic life reaches conclusions which harmonize with these c m geisler der einfluss der dunkelheit auf das seelenleben des menschen weitelschaftsrisch ver weitelschaftsrisch philosophie nineteen o four pages two fifty five to two seventy nine i have not been able to see geisler's paper but according to a summary of it he comes to the result that in the dark the soul's activities are nearer to its motor pole than to its sensitive pole and that there is a tendency for phenomena belonging to the early period of development to be prominent motor memory functioning more than representative memory attention more than a perception imagination more than logical thinking egoistic force more than altruistic morals it is curious to note that short-sightedness naturally though illogically tends to exert the same influence as darkness in this respect i am assured by short-sighted persons of both sexes that they are much more liable to the emotions of shyness and modesty with their glasses than without them such persons with difficulty realize that they are not so dim to others as others are to them to be in the company of a blind person seems also to be a protection against shyness it is interesting to learn that congenitally blind children are as sensitive to appearances as normal children and blush as readily this would seem to be due to the fact that the habitually blind have permanently adjusted their mental focus to that of normal persons and react in the same manner as normal persons blindness is not for them as it is for the short-sighted without their glasses a temporary and relative almost unconscious refuge from clear vision it is of course not as the mere cloak of a possible blush that darkness gives courage it is because it lulls detailed self-realization such conscious self-realization being always a force of fears and the blush their definite symbol and visible climax it is to the blush that we must attribute a curious complementary relationship between the face and the sacro-pubic region as centers of anatomical modesty the women of some african tribes who go naked m n bay remarked cover the face with the hand under the influence of modesty martial law long since observed l i b three sixty eight that when an innocent girl looks at the penis she gazes through her fingers where as among many mohammedan peoples the face is the chief focus of modesty the exposure of the rest of the body including sometimes even the sacropubic region and certainly the legs and thighs often become a matter of indifference the concealment of the face is more than a convention it has a psychological basis we may observe among ourselves the well-marked feminine tendency to hide the face in order to cloak a possible blush and to hide the eyes as a method of lulling self-consciousness a method fabulously attributed to the ostrich with the same end of concealment a woman who is shy with her lover will sometimes experience little or no difficulty in showing any part of her person provided she may cover her face when in gynecological practice examination of the sexual organs is necessary women frequently find evident satisfaction in concealing the face with the hands although 
not the slightest attention is being directed towards the face and when an unsophisticated woman is betrayed into a confession which affects her modesty she is apt to turn her back to her interlocutor when the face of woman is covered it has been said her heart is bared and the catholic church has recognized this psychological truth by arranging that in the confessional the penitent's face shall not be visible the gay and innocent freedom of southern women during carnival is due not entirely to the permitted license of the season or the concealment of identity but to the mask that hides the face england during queen elizabeth's reign and at the restoration it was possible for respectable women to be present at the theatre even during the performance of the most free-spoken plays because they wore masks the fan has often observed a similar end all such facts serve to show that though the form of modesty may change it is yet a very radical constituent of human nature in all stages of civilization and that it is to a large extent maintained by the mechanism of blushing end of evolution of modesty part three read by john thomas coos www.validateyourlife.com evolution of modesty part four of studies in the psychology of sex Volume 1 by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Graymore. The Evolution of Modesty, Part 4. We have seen that the factors of modesty are numerous. To attempt to explain modesty by dismissing it as merely an example of psychic paralysis, of staying, is to elude the problem by the statement of what is little more than a truism. Modesty is a complexus of emotions, with their concomitant ideas which we must unravel to comprehend. We have found among the factors of modesty, one, the primitive animal gesture of sexual refusal on the part of the female, when she is not at that moment of her generative life at which she desires the male's advances. Two, the fear of arousing disgust, a fear primarily due to the close proximity of the sexual center to the points of exit of those excretions which are useless and unpleasant, even in many cases to animals. 3. The fear of the magic influence of sexual phenomena, and the ceremonial and ritual practices primarily based on this fear, and ultimately passing into simple rules of decorum, which are signs and guardians of modesty. 4. The development of ornament and clothing, concomitantly fostering alike the modesty which represses male sexual desire and the coquetry which seeks to allure it. 5. The conception of women as property, imparting a new and powerful sanction to an emotion already based on more natural and primitive facts. It must always be remembered that these factors do not usually occur separately. Very often they are all of them implied in a single impulse of modesty. We unravel the cord in order to investigate its construction, but in real life the strands are more or less indistinguishably twisted together. It may still be asked finally whether on the whole modesty really becomes a more prominent emotion as civilization advances. I do not think this position can be maintained. It is a great mistake, as we have seen, to suppose that in becoming extended modesty also becomes intensified. On the contrary, this very extension is a sign of weakness. Among savages, modesty is far more radical and invincible than among the civilized. Of the Oricanian women of Chile, Trutler has remarked that they are distinctly more modest than the Christian white population, and such observations might be indefinitely extended. It is, as we have already noted, in a new and crude civilization, eager to mark its separation from a barbarism, it has yet scarcely escaped, that we find an extravagant and fantastic anxiety to extend the limits of modesty in life and art and literature. In older and more mature civilizations, in classical antiquity, in old Japan, in France, modesty, while still a very real influence, becomes a much less predominant and all-pervading influence. In life it becomes subservient to human use, in art to beauty, 
in literature to expression. Among ourselves we may note that modesty is a much more invincible motive among the lower social classes than among the more cultivated classes. This is so even when we should expect the influence of occupation to induce familiarity. Thus I have been told of a ballet girl who thinks it immodest to bathe in the fashion customary at the seaside and cannot make up her mind to do so, but she appears on the stage every night in tights as a matter of course while Fanny Kemble, in her reminiscences, tells of an actress accustomed to appear in tights, who died a martyr to modesty, rather than allow a surgeon to see her inflamed knee. Modesty is, indeed, a part of self-respect, but in the fully developed human being, self-respect itself holds in check any excessive modesty. We must remember, moreover, that there are more definite grounds for the subordination of modesty with the development of civilization. We have seen that the factors of modesty are many, and that most of them are based on emotions which make little urgent appeal save to races in a savage or barbarous condition. Thus disgust, as Richet has truly pointed out, necessarily decreases as knowledge increases. As we analyze and understand our experiences better, so they cause us less disgust. A rotten egg is disgusting, but the chemist feels no disgust toward sulfuretted hydrogen. While a solution of propylamine does not produce the disgusting impression of that human physical uncleanliness of which it is an odorous constituent, as disgust becomes analyzed and as self-respect tends to increase physical purity, so the factor of disgust in modesty is minimized. The factor of ceremonial uncleanness, again, which plays so urgent a part in modesty at certain stages of culture, is today without influence except in so far as it survives in etiquette. In the same way, the social-economic factor of modesty, based on the conception of women as property, belongs to a stage of human development which is wholly alien to an advanced civilization. Even the most fundamental impulse of all, the gesture of sexual refusal, is normally only imperative among animals and savages. Thus civilization tends to subordinate, if not to minimize, modesty, to render it a grace of life rather than a fundamental social law of life but an essential grace of life it still remains, and whatever delicate variations it may assume, we can scarcely conceive of its disappearance. In the art of love, however, it is more than a grace. It must always be fundamental. Modesty is not indeed the last word of love, but it is the necessary foundation for all love's most exquisite audacities. The foundation which alone gives worth and sweetness to what St. Encore calls its delicious impudence. Without modesty we could not have, nor rightly value at its true worth, that bold and pure candor, which is at once the final revelation of love and the seal of its sincerity. Even Ho and Emser, who argues that for the perfect man there could be no shame, because shame rests on an inner conflict in one's own personality, and the perfect man knows no inner conflict, believes that since humanity is imperfect, modesty possesses a high and indeed symptomatic value for its presence shows that according to the measure of a man's ideal personality, his valuations are established. Dugas goes further and asserts that the ideals of modesty develop with human development, and forever take on new and finer forms. There is, he declares, a very close relationship between naturalness, or sincerity, and modesty, for in love naturalness is the ideal attained, and modesty is only the fear of coming short of that ideal. Naturalness is the sign and the test of perfect love. It is the sign of it, for when love can show itself natural and true, one may conclude that it is purified of its unavowable imperfections or defects, of its alloy of wretched and petty passions, its grossness, its chimerical notions, that it has become strong and healthy and vigorous. It is the ordeal of it, for to show itself natural, to be always true, without shrinking, it must have all the lovable qualities and have them without seeking as a second nature. What we call natural is indeed really acquired. It is the gift of a physical and moral evolution, which it is precisely the object of modesty to keep. Modesty is the feeling of the true, that is to say, of the healthy in love. It long exists as a vision, not yet attained, vague yet sufficiently clear for all that deviates from it to be repelled as offensive and painful. At first, a remote and seemingly inaccessible ideal, 
as it comes nearer it grows human and individual and emerges from the region of dream ceasing not to be loved as ideal even when it is possessed as real at first sight it seems paradoxical to define modesty as an aspiration towards truth and love it seems on the contrary to be an altogether factitious feeling but to simplify the problem we have to suppose modesty reduced to its normal functions disengaged from its superstitions its variegated customs and prejudices the true modesty of simple and healthy natures as far removed from prudery as from immodesty and what we term the natural or the true in love is the singular mingling of two forms of imaginations wrongly supposed to be incompatible ideal aspiration and the sense for the realities of life thus defined modesty not only repudiates that cold and dissolving criticism which deprives love of all poetry and prepares the way for a brutal realism it also excludes that light and detached imagination which floats above love the mere idealism of heroic sentiments which cherishes poetic illusions and passes without seeing it the love that is real and alive true modesty implies a love not addressed to the heroes of vain romances but to living people with their feet on the earth but on the other hand modesty is the respect of love if it is not shocked by its physical necessities if it accepts physiological and psychological conditions it also maintains the ideal of those moral proprieties outside of which for all of us love cannot be enjoyed when love is really felt and not vainly imagined modesty is the requirement of an ideal of dignity conceived as the very condition of that love separate modesty from love that is from love which is not floating in the air but crystallized around a real person and its psychological reality its poignant and tragic character disappears dugas la poudre revue philosophique november 1903 so conceived modesty becomes a virtue almost identical with the roman modestia end of the evolution of modesty part four Phenomena of Sexual Periodicity Part 1, Section 1 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex Volume 1 by Havelock Ellis This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by John Burnett The Phenomena of Sexual Periodicity Part 1, Section 1 Throughout the vegetable and animal worlds, the sexual functions are periodic. From the usually annual period of flowering in plants, with its play of sperm cell and germ cell and consequent seed production, through the varying sexual energies of animals, up to the monthly effervescence of the generative organism in woman, seeking not without the shedding of blood for the gratification of its reproduction function. From first to last, we have unfailing evidence of the periodicity of sex. At first, the sun, and then some have thought the moon, have marked throughout a rhythmic impress on the phenomena of sex. To understand these phenomena, we have not only to recognize the bare existence of that periodic fact, but to realize its implications. Rhythm, it is scarcely necessary to remark, is far from characterizing sexual activity alone. It is the character of all biological activity, alike on the physical and psychic sides. All the organs of the body appear to be in perpetual process of rhythmic contraction and expansion. The heart is rhythmic, so is the respiration, the spleen is rhythmic also the bladder. The uterus constantly undergoes regular rhythmic contractions at brief intervals. The vascular system, down to the smallest capillaries, is acted on by three series of vibrations, and every separate fragment of muscular tissue possesses rhythmic contractility. Growth itself is rhythmic, and, as Mollen Hansen and subsequent observers have found, follows a regular annual course as well as a larger cycle. On the psyche sides, attention is rhythmic. We are always irresistibly compelled to impart a rhythm to every succession of sounds, however uniform and monotonous. A familiar example of this is the rhythm we can seldom refrain from hearing in the puffing of an engine. A series of experiments by Bolton on 30 subjects showed that the clicks of an electric telephone connected in an induction apparatus nearly always fell into rhythmic groups, usually two or four, rarely three or five the rhythmic perception of being accompanied by a strong impulse to make corresponding muscular movements. It is, however, with the influence to some extent real, 
to some extent perhaps only apparent of cosmic rhythm that we are here concerned. The general tendency, physical and psychic, of nervous action to fall into rhythm is merely interesting from the present point of view as showing a biological predisposition to accept any periodicity that is habitually imposed upon the organism. Menstruation has always been associated with the lunar revolutions. Darwin, without specifically mentioning menstruation, has suggested that the explanation of the allied cycle of gestation in mammals, as well as in incubation in birds, may be found in the condition under which the ascidians live at high and low water in consequence of the phenomena of tidal change. It must, however, be remembered that the ascidian origins of the vertebrate has since been contested from many sides, and even if we admit that all the events of such allied conditions in the early history of vertebrates and their ancestors tended to impress a lunar cycle on the race, it must be still remembered that the monthly periodicity of menstruation only becomes well marked in the human species. Bearing in mind the influence exerted on both the habits and the emotions even of animals by the brightness of moonlight nights, it is perhaps not extravagant to suppose that, on organisms already ancestrally predisposed to the influence of rhythm in general, and of cosmic rhythm in particular, the periodically reoccurring full moon, not merely by the stimulation of the nervous system, but possibly by the special opportunities which it gave for the exercise of sexual functions, served to implant a lunar rhythm on menstruation. How important such a factor may be, we have evidence in the fact that the daily life of even the most civilized people is still regulated by a weekly cycle, which is apparently a segment of a cosmic lunar cycle. Monte Gaza has suggested that the sexual period may become established with relation to the lunar period because moonlight nights were favorable to courting and Nelson remarks that in his experience, young and robust persons are subject to recurrent periods of wakefulness at night in which they attribute to the action of the full moon. One may perhaps refer to also the tendency of bright moonlight to stir the emotions of the young, especially at puberty, a tendency which in neurotic persons may become almost morbid. It is interesting to point out that the further back we are able to trace the beginnings of culture, the more important we find the part played by the moon. Next to the alteration of day and night, the moon's changes are the most conspicuous and startling phenomena of nature. They first suggest a basis for reckoning time. They are the greatest use in primitive agriculture, and everywhere the moon is held to have vast influence on the whole of organic life. Hahn has suggested that the reason why mythological systems do not usually present the moon in the supreme position which we should expect is that its immense importance is so ancient a fact that it tends with mythological development to become overlaid by other elements. According to Seller, Quasicuato and Tezelepoca, the two most considerable figures in the Mexican Pantheon, are to be regarded mainly as complementary forms of the moon divinity. And the moon was the chief Mexican measurer of time. Even in Babylonia, where the sun was most specially revered, at the earliest period the moon ranked higher, being gradually superseded by the worship of the sun. Although such considerations as these by no means take us as far back as the earliest appearance of menstruation, they may serve to indicate that the phases of the moon probably played a large part in the earliest evolution of man. With that statement, we must at present rest content. It is possible that the monthly character of menstruation, while representing a general tendency of the human race, always and everywhere prevalent, may be modified in the future. It is a noteworthy fact that among many primitive races menstruation only occurs at long intervals. Thus, among Eskimo women, menstruation follows the peculiar cosmic condition to which the people are subjected. Cook, the ethnologist of the Perry North Greenland expedition, found that menstruation only began after the age of 19, and that it was usually suppressed during the winter months, when there was no sun, only about 1 in 10 women continuing to menstruate during this period. It was stated by Velpiu that Lapland and Greenland women usually only menstruate every three months, or even only two or three times during the year. On the Faroe Islands, it is said that menstruation is frequently absent. Among the Samoyeds, Montegaza mentions that menstruation is so slight that some travelers have denied its existence. Azara noted among the Guaranis of Paraguay that menstruation was not only slight in amount, but the periods were separated by long intervals. Among the Indians in North America, again, menstruation appears to be scanty. Thus, Holder, speaking of his experience in the Crow Indians of Montana, says, 
I am quite sure that full-blooded Indians in this latitude do not menstruate so freely as white women, not usually exceeding three days. Among the naked women of Tierra de Fuego, it is said that there is often no physical sign of menses for six months at a time. These observations are noteworthy, though they clearly indicate, on the whole, that primitiveness in race is very powerless factor without a cold climate. On the other hand, again, there is some reason to suppose that in Europe there is a latent tendency in some women for the menstrual cycle to split up further into two cycles, by the appearance of a latent minor climax in the middle of the monthly interval. I allude to the phenomena usually called mittelschmerz, middle period or intermenstrual pain. Since the investigations of Goodman, Stevenson, Van Ott Reynel, Jacobi, and others, it has been generally recognized that the menstruation is a continuous process, the flow being merely the climax of a menstrual cycle, a physiological wave which is in constant flux or reflux. This cycle manifests itself in all a woman's activities, in metabolism, respiration, temperature, etc., as well as on the nervous and psychic sides. The healthier the woman is, the less conscious the cyclic return of her life. But the cycle may be traced, as Hedger has found, even before puberty takes place. While Serlini has found that even in amenorrhea, the menstrual cycle still manifests itself in the temperature and respiration. For a summary of the phenomena of menstrual cycle, see Havelock Ellis, Man and Woman, 4th edition, revised and enlarged, Chapter 11, The Functional Periodicity of Women. Mittelschmerz is a condition of pain occurring about the middle of the intermenstrual period, either alone or accompanied by a slight sanguineous discharge, or more frequently, a non sanguineous discharge. The phenomena varies, but seems usually to occur about the 14th day, and to last two or three days. Laycock, in 1840, gave instances of women with an intermenstrual period. De Paul and Genoi speak of an intermenstrual symptoms and even actual flow, as occurring in women who are in a perfect state of health, and constituting genuine regularis sumnimaris. The condition is, however, said to have been first fully described by Valix, then, in 18,725, by Sir William Priestley, and subsequently by Failing Fassbender, Sorrel, Halliday Croom, Finley Adensel, and others. Also, Flies goes so far as to assert that an intermenstrual period of menstrual symptoms, which terms nebin menstration, is a phenomenon well known to most healthy women. Observations are at present too few to allow any definite conclusions, and in some of the cases, so far recorded a pathological condition of the sexual organs has been found to exist. Rosner of Kakao, however, found that only one case out of twelve was there any disease present? And Storer, who has met with 20 cases, insists on the remarkable and definite regularity of the manifestations, wholly unlike those of neurologia. There is no agreement as to the cause of Mittelschmerz. Adensel attributed it to the disease of the fallopian tubes. This, however, is denied by such competent authorities as Cullingworth and Bland Sutton. Others, like Priestley and subsequent Marsh, have thought to find the explanation in the occurrence of ovulation. This theory is, however, unsupported by facts and eventually rests on the exploded belief that ovulation is the cause of menstruation. Rosner, following Richelieu, vaguely attributes it to the diffused hyperemia, which is generally present. Van de Velde also attributed it to abnormal fall of vascular tone, causing passive congestion of pelvic vascura. Others, again, like Armand Routh and Michelin, in the course of an interesting discussion on mental schmears in the Obstetric Society of London, on the second day of March, 1898, believe that we may trace here a double menstruation and would explain the phenomena by assuming that, in certain cases, there is intramural as well as menstrual cycle. The question is not yet ripe for settlement, though it is fully evident that, looking broadly at the phenomena of rut and menstruation, the main basis of their increasing frequency, as we rise towards civilized man, is the increase of nutrition, heat and sunlight being factors of nutrition. When dealing with civilized man, however, we are probably concerned not merely with general nutrition, but with the nervous direction of that nutrition. At this stage, it is natural to inquire what the corresponding phenomena are among animals. Unfortunately, imperfect as is our comprehension of the human phenomena, 
Our knowledge of the corresponding phenomena among animals is much more fragmentary and incomplete. Among most animals, menstruation does not exist, being replaced by what is known as heat or cestra, which usually occurs once or twice a year, in spring and in autumn, sometimes affecting the male as well as the female. There is, however, a great deal of progression in the upward march of the phenomena as we approach our own and allied zoological series. Heat in domesticated cows usually occurs every three weeks. The female hippopotamus in the zoological gardens has been observed to exhibit monthly sexual excitement with swelling and secretion from the vulva. Progression is not only towards greater frequency with higher evolution or with increased domestication, but there is also a change in the character of the flow. As Wiltshire, in his remarkable lectures on the comparative physiology of menstruation, asserted as a law, the more highly evolved the animal, the more sanguineous the catamenial flow. It is not until we reach the monkeys that this character of the flow becomes well marked. Monthly sanguineous discharges have been observed among many monkeys. In the 17th century, various observers in many parts of the world, Bonius, Perrier, Helbigius, Van der Weel, and others noted menstruation in monkeys. Buffon observed it among various monkeys as well as the orangutan. J. G. St. Hilaire and Cuvier, many years ago, declared that menstruation exists among a variety of monkeys and lower apes. Renger described the vaginal discharge in a species of Sibius in Paraguay, while Rakiborski observed the Jardin des Plantes that the menstrual hemorrhage in genuines was so abundant, the floor of the cage was covered by it to a considerable extent. The same variety of monkey was observed by Suriname, by Hill, a surgeon in the Dutch army, who noted an abundant sanguineous flow occurring at every new moon and lasting about three days, the animal at this time also showing signs of sexual excitement. The macaque and the baboon appear to be the non-human animals in which menstruation has been most carefully observed. In the former, besides the flow, Bland Sutton remarks that all the naked or pale-colored parts of the body, such as the face, neck, ischial regions, assume a lively pink color. In some cases, it is a vivid red. The flow is slight, but the coloring lasts several days, and in warm weather, the labia are much swollen. Heap has most fully and carefully described menstruation in monkeys. He found cal in Calcutta that the Macacus cynomologus menstruated regularly on the 20th of December, 20th of January, and about the 20th of February. The Cynocephalus porcaria and the Semopithecus entellius both menstruated each month for about four days. At the macaque, rhesus, and cynomogalus, at menstruation, the nipples and vulva become swollen and deeply congested, and the skin of the buttocks swollen, tense, and of a brilliant red or even purple color. The abdominal wall also, for a short space upward, and inside of the thighs, sometimes as far down as the heel, and the undersurface of the tail for half its length or more, are all covered in a vivid red, while the skin of the face, especially about the eyes, is flushed or blotched with red. In the late gestation, the coloring is still more vivid. Something similar is to be seen in the males also. Distant, who kept a female baboon for some time, has recorded the dates of menstruation during the year. He found that nine periods occurred during the year. The average length between the periods was nearly six weeks, but they occurred more frequently in the late autumn and in the winter than in the summer. It is an interesting fact, Heap noted, that Notwithstanding menstruation, the seasonal influence, or rut, still persisted in the monkeys he investigated. In the anthropoid apes, Hartman remarks that several observers have recorded periodic menstruation in the chimpanzee, with flushing and enlargement of the external parts, and protrusion of the external lips, which were not usually visible, while there is often excessive enlargement and reddening of these parts, and of the posterior callicites, during sexual excitement. Very little, however, appears to be definitely known regarding any form of menstruation in the higher apes. M. Deichner, who has made a special study of the anthropoid apes, informs me that he has so far been able to make definite observations regarding the existence of menstruation. Ma remarks that he received information regarding such a phenomena in the orangutan. A pair of orangutans was kept in the Berlin Zoological Garden some years ago and the female was stated to have, at intervals, a menstrual flow resembling that of a woman, and during this period to refrain from sexual congress, which was otherwise usually exercised at regular intervals, at least every two or three days. Maul adds, however, that while his informant is a reliable man, the length of time 
that has elapsed may have led him to mistake in details. Keith, in a paper read before the Zoological Society of London, has ascribed the menstruation in a chimpanzee. It occurred every 23rd or 24th day and lasted for three days. The discharge was profuse, at first appeared in about the ninth or 10th year. End of The Phenomena of Sexual Periodicity, Part 1, Section 1. Phenomena of Sexual Periodicity, Part 1, Section 2 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 1, by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by John Fricker. The Phenomena of Sexual Periodicity, Part 1, Section 2. What is menstruation? It is easy to describe it by its obvious symptoms, as a monthly discharge of blood from the uterus, but nearly as much as that was known in the infancy of the world. When we seek to probe more intimately into the nature of menstruation, we are still baffled, not merely as regards its cause, but even as regards its precise mechanism. The primary cause of menstruation remains unexplained. The cause of menstruation remains as obscure as ever. So conclude two of the most thorough and cautious investigators into this subject. It is, however, widely accepted that the main cause of menstruation is a rhythmic contraction of the uterus, the result of a disappointed preparation for impregnation, a kind of miniature childbirth. This seems to be the most reasonable view of menstruation, i.e. as an abortion of a decidua. Burdack, according to Beard, was the first who described menstruation as an abortive parturition. The hypothesis, Marshall and Jolly conclude, that the entire proestrous process is of the nature of a preparation for the lodgment of the ovum is in accordance with the facts. Fortunately, since we are here primarily concerned with its psychological aspects, the precise biological cause and the physiological nature of menstruation do not greatly concern us. There is, however, one point which of late years has been definitely determined, and which should not be passed without mention, the relation of menstruation to ovulation. It was once supposed that the maturation of an ovule in the ovaries was the necessary accompaniment, and even cause of menstruation. We now know that ovulation proceeds throughout the whole of life, even before birth, and during gestation and that removal of the ovaries by no means necessarily involves a cessation of menstruation. It has been shown that regular and even excessive menstruation may take place in the congenital absence of a trace of ovaries or fallopian tubes. On the other hand, a rudimentary state of the uterus and a complete absence of menstruation may exist with well-developed ovaries and normal ovulation. We must regard the uterus as to some extent an independent organ, and menstruation is a process which arose, no doubt, with the object, teleologically speaking, of cooperating more effectively with ovulation, but has become largely independent. It is sometimes stated that menstruation may be entirely absent in perfect health. Few cases of this condition have, however, been recorded with the detail necessary to prove the assertion. One such case was investigated by Dr. W. H. Mitchell and described in a paper read to the New York County Medical Society, February 22, 1892, to be found in Medical Reprints, June 1892. The subject was a young unmarried woman, 24 years of age. She was born in Ireland and until her emigration lived quietly at home with her parents. Being then 20 years of age, she left home and came to New York. Up to that time no signs of menstruation had appeared, and she had never heard that such a function existed. Soon after her arrival in New York, she obtained a situation as a waiting maid, and it was noticed after a time that she was not unwell at each month. Friends filled her ears with wild stories about the dreadful effects likely to follow, the absence of menstruation. This worried her greatly, and, as a consequence, she became pale and anemic, with loss of flesh, appetite and sleep, and a long train of imaginary nervous symptoms. She presented herself for treatment and insisted upon a uterine examination. This revealed no pathological condition of her uterus. She was assured that she would not die, or become insane, nor a chronic invalid. 
In consequence, she soon forgot that she differed in any way from other girls. A course of collegiate tonics, generous diet, and proper care of her general health soon restored her to her normal condition. After close observation for several years, she submitted to a thorough examination, although entirely free from any abnormal symptoms. The examination revealed the following physical condition. Weight, 105 pounds. Her weight before leaving Ireland was 130. Girth of chest, 29 and a half inches. Girth of abdomen, 25 inches. Girth of pelvis, 34 and a half inches. Girth of thigh, upper third, 20 inches. Heart, healthy. Sounds and rhythm, perfectly normal. Pulse, 76. Lungs, healthy. Respiratory murmur, clear and distinct over every part. Respiration, easy and twenty per minute. The mammae are well developed, firm and round. Nipples small, no areola. Her skin is soft, smooth and healthy. Figure erect, plump and symmetrical. Her bowels are regular. Kidneys, healthy. She has a good appetite, sleeps well, and in no particular shows any signs of ill health. The uterine examination reveals a short vagina and a small round cervix uteri, rather less in size than the average, and projecting very slightly into the vaginal canal. Depth of uterus from os to fundus, two and a quarter inches, is very nearly normal. No external sign of abnormal ovaries. She is a well-developed, healthy young woman, performing all her physiological functions naturally and regularly, except the single function of menstruation. No vicarious menstruation takes place in the natural function. Though she has been watched very closely during the past two years, nor the least periodical excitement. It is added that, though the clitoris is normal, the mons veneris is almost destitute of hair and the labia rather underdeveloped, while, as far as is known, sexual instincts and desire are entirely absent. These latter facts, I may add, would seem to suggest that, in spite of the health of the subject, there is yet some concealed lack of development of the sexual system of congenital character. In a case recorded by Plant, in which the internal sexual organs were almost wholly undeveloped and of the menstruation absent. The labia was similarly underdeveloped and the pubic hair scanty, while the axillary hair was wholly absent, though that of the head was long and strong. We may now regard as purely academic the discussion formerly carried on as to whether menstruation is to be regarded as analogous to heat in female animals. For many centuries, at least, the resemblance has been sufficiently obvious. Rakai Borsky and Pouchet, who first established the regular periodicity of ovulation in mammals, identified heat and menstruation. During the past century there was, notwithstanding, an occasional tendency to deny any real connection. No satisfactory grounds for this denial have, however, been brought forward. Lawson Tate, indeed, and more recently Beard, have stated that menstruation cannot be the period of heat because women have a disinclination to the approach of the male at that time. But, as we shall see later, this statement is unfounded. An argument which might indeed be brought forward is the very remarkable fact that while in mammals the period of heat is the only period for sexual intercourse, among all human races from the very lowest the period of menstruation is the one period during which sexual intercourse is strictly prohibited sometimes under severe penalties even life itself this however is a social not a physiological fact Ploss and Bartels call attention to the curious contrast in this respect between heat and menstruation the same authors also mention that in the Middle Ages, however, preachers found it necessary to warn their hearers against the sin of intercourse during the menstrual period. It may be added that Aquinas and many other early theologians held not only that such intercourse was a deadly sin, but that it engendered leprous and monstrous children. Some later theologians, however, like Sanchez, argued that the Mosaic enactments, such as Leviticus chapter 20, verse 18, no longer hold good. Modern theologians, in part influenced by the tolerant traditions of Liguri, and in part by De Brain, informed by medical science, no longer prohibit intercourse during menstruation or regard it as only a venial sin. 
we have here a remarkable but not an isolated example of the tendency of the human mind in its development to rebel against the claims of primitive nature the whole of religion is a similar remoulding of nature a repression of natural impulses an effort to turn them into new channels prohibition of intercourse during menstruation is a fundamental element of savage ritual an element which is universal merely because the conditions which caused it are universal and because as is now beginning to be generally recognized the courses of human psychic evolution are everywhere the same a strictly analogous phenomenon in the sexual sphere itself is the opposed attitude in barbarism and civilization towards the sexual organs under barbaric conditions and among savages when no magio religious ideas intervene the sexual organs are beautiful and pleasurable objects under modern conditions this is not so this difference of attitude is reflected in sculpture in savage and barbaric carvings of human beings the sexual organs of both sexes are often enormously exaggerated this is true of the archaic European figures on which Salomon Reinach has thrown so much light, but in modern sculpture, from the time when it reached its perfection in Greece onward, the sexual regions in both men and women are systematically minimized. With advancing culture, as again we shall see later, there is a conflict of claims, and certain considerations are regarded as higher and more potent than merely natural claims nakedness is more natural than clothing and on many grounds more desirable under the average circumstances of life yet everywhere under the stress of what are regarded as higher considerations there is a tendency for all races to add more and more to the burden of clothes in the same way it happens that the tendency of the female to sexual intercourse during menstruation has everywhere been overlaid by the ideas of a culture which has insisted on regarding menstruation as a supernatural phenomenon which for the protection of everybody must be strictly tabooed this tendency is reinforced and in high civilization replaced by the claims of an aesthetic regard for concealment and reserve during this period such facts are significant for the early history of culture but they must not blind us to the real analogy between heat and menstruation an analogy or even identity which may be said to be accepted now by most careful investigators it is perhaps somewhat excessive to declare with john stone that woman is the only animal in which rut is omnipresent we must admit that the two groups of phenomena merge into or replace each other that their object is identical that they involve similar psychic conditions here also we see a striking example of the way in which women preserve a primitive phenomenon which earlier in the zoological series was common to both sexes but which man has now lost heat and menstruation with whatever difference of detail are practically the same phenomenon we cannot understand menstruation unless we bear this in mind on the psychic state of chief normal and primitive characteristics for the menstrual state is the more predominant presence of the sexual impulse there are other mental and emotional signs of irritability and instability which tend to slightly impair complete mental integrity and tend to render in some unbalanced individuals explosions of anger or depression in rarer cases crime more common but the heightening of the sexual impulse languor shyness and caprice are the more human manifestations of an emotional state which in some of the lower female animals during heat may produce a state of fury the actual period of the menstrual flow at all events the first two or three days does not among european women usually appear to show any heightening of sexual emotion this heightening occurs usually a few days before and especially during the latter part of the flow and immediately after it ceases i have however convinced myself by inquiry that this absence of sexual feeling during the height of the flow is in large part apparent only no doubt the onset of the flow often producing a general depression of vitality may tend directly to depress the emotions which are heightened by the general emotional state and local congestion of the days immediately preceding but among some women at all events who are normal and in good health i find that the period of menstruation itself is covered by the period of the climax of sexual feeling thus a married lady writes my feelings are always very strong not only just before and after but during the period very unfortunately as of course they cannot then be gratified 
while a refined girl of nineteen living a chaste life without either coitus or masturbation which she has never practised habitually feels very strong sexual excitement about the time of menstruation and more especially during the period this desire torments her life prevents her from sleeping at these times and she looks upon it as a kind of illness I could quote many other similar and equally emphatic statements, and the fact that so cardinal a relation of the sexual life of women should be ignored or denied by most writers on this matter is a curious proof of the prevailing ignorance. This ignorance has been fostered by the fact that women often disguise even to themselves the real state of their feelings. One lady remarks that while she would be very ready for coitus during menstruation, the thought that it is impossible during that time makes her put the idea of it out of her mind. I have reason to think that this statement may be taken to represent the real feelings of very many women. The aversion to coitus is real, but it is often due not to failure of sexual desire, but to the inhibitory action of powerful extraneous causes. The absence of active sexual desire in women during the height of the flow may thus be regarded as, in part, a physiological fact, following from the correspondence of the actual menstrual flow to the period of pro estrum and in part a psychological fact due to the aesthetic repugnance to union when in such a condition, and to the unquestioned acceptance of the general belief that at such a period intercourse is out of the question some of the strongest factors of modesty especially the fear of causing disgust and the sense of the demands of ceremonial ritual would thus help to hold in check the sexual emotions during this period and when under the influence of insanity these motives are in abeyance the coincidence of sexual desire with the menstrual flow often becomes more obvious it must be added that, especially among the lower social classes, the primitive belief of the savage that coitus during menstruation is bad for the man still persists Ploss and Bartels mention that among the peasants of some parts of Germany, where it is believed that impregnation is impossible during menstruation, coitus at that time would be frequent were it not thought dangerous for the man. It has also been a common belief, both in ancient and modern times, that coitus during menstruation engenders monsters. Notwithstanding all the obstacles that are thus placed in the way of coitus during menstruation, there is nevertheless good reason to believe that the first coitus very frequently takes place at this point of least psychic resistance. When still a student, I was struck by the occurrence of cases in which the seduction took place during the menstrual flow, though at that time they seemed to me inexplicable, except as evidencing brutality on the part of the seducer. Negrier, in the lying-in wards of the Hôtel Dieu at Angers, constantly found the women from the country who came there pregnant as a result of a single coitus had been impregnated at or near the menstrual epoch, more especially when the period coincided with a feast day as St. John's Day or Christmas. Whatever doubt may exist as to the most frequent state of the sexual emotions during the period of menstruation, there can be no doubt, whatever, that immediately before and immediately after, very commonly at both times, this varying slightly in different women, there is usually a marked heightening of actual desire. It is at this period, and sometimes during the menstrual flow, that masturbation may take place in women who at other times have no strong autoerotic impulse. The only women who do not show this heightening of sexual emotion seem to be those in whom sexual feelings have not yet been definitely called into consciousness, or the small minority, usually suffering from some disorder of sexual or general health, in whom there is a high degree of sexual anaesthesia. The majority of authorities admit a heightening of sexual emotion before or after the menstrual crisis. See, for example, Kraft Eberg, who places it in the postmenstrual period. Adler states that sexual feeling is increased before, during, and after menstruation. Kosman advises intercourse just after menstruation, or even during the latter days of the flow, as the period when it is most needed. Guyot says that the eight days after menstruation are the period of sexual desire in women. Harry Campbell investigated the periodicity of sexual desire in healthy women of the working classes in a series of cases by inquiries made of their husbands who were patients at a London hospital. People of this class are not always skilful in observation, and the method adopted would permit many facts to pass unrecorded. It is therefore noteworthy that only in one-third of the cases had no connection between menstruation and sexual feeling been observed. 
in the other two-thirds sexual feeling was increased either before after or during the flow or at all of these times the proportion of cases in which sexual feeling was increased before the flow to those in which it was increased after was as three to two even this elementary fact of the sexual life has however been denied and strange to say by two women doctors Dr. Mary Putnam Jacobi of New York, who furnished valuable contributions to the physiology of menstruation, wrote some years ago in a paper on the theory of menstruation, in reference to the question of the connection between estrus and menstruation, neither can any such rhythmical alteration of sexual instinct be demonstrated in women as would lead to the inference that the menstrual crisis was an expression of this, i.e., of estrus dr elizabeth blackwell again in her book on the human element in sex asserts that the menstrual flow itself affords complete relief for the sexual feelings in women like sexual emissions during sleep in men and thus practically denies the prevalence of sexual desire in the immediately post-menstrual period when on such a theory sexual feeling should be at its minimum it is fair to add that dr blackwell's opinion is merely the survival of a view which was widely held a century ago when various writers bordeaux roussel duffio j arnold etc as eckard has pointed out regarded menstruation as a device of providence for safeguarding the virginity of women end of the phenomenon of sexual periodicity part one section two